Hello, my name is David Cermak. I am a principal application engineer at Duquesne. In today's tech talk, we're going to discuss material selection strategies for ultrasonic welding. We'll go into various different types of thermoplastic materials you might encounter, some of their physical properties, and how that might inform your decision making when selecting ultrasonic welding as your assembly technology. Polymers come in two generic styles, thermoset resins and thermoplastic resins. Thermoset resins are not weldable. If you try to reprocess a thermoset plastic part or component, it simply burns. It does not melt and reform. As a result, we cannot bond those parts together. These are things like silicone, polyester, and certain polyurethane resins. Thermoplastic resins, on the other hand, are almost universally processable with ultrasonics. They come in two families, amorphous and semi-crystalline. Amorphous resins are things like polycarbonate, ABS, polystyrene. Semi-crystalline resins are things like polypropylene, high-density polyethylene, nylon, delrin, things like that. The reason we discuss thermoplastics in their two different forms is because of the different physical structure that they have. Amorphous resins are kind of like spaghetti. There are long chains of polymers, all randomly arranged and interconnected in the crystal structure of those resins. Semi-crystalline resins, on the other hand, have structured areas. There are places where the polymer chains all line up in an orderly fashion. This difference in the crystal structure plays a big role in how we process them when we ultrasonically bond them. So it's important to understand. Specifically, that difference in molecular structure and how those chains bond informs their melt characteristics. Amorphous resins act kind of like butter. They have a broad softening range, but not a sharp temperature at which they transition to a liquid. If you put a stick of butter on a table, for instance, when it's cold and you press it with your finger, it would not deform. If you let it come up to room temperature and press it with your finger again, you would leave a finger imprint in that material, but you wouldn't necessarily describe it as a liquid. It's still a solid, but it has a memory of that deformation. This is how amorphous resins remelt when we process them using ultrasonics. And as a result, there are some real benefits to that. Semi-crystalline resins, on the other hand, act kind of like ice. If you place a cube of ice on a table, it stays solid until it reaches the melting temperature. Once it reaches the melting temperature, it transitions into a liquid. There is both a solid and a liquid present as it is transitioning. It has a sharp melting temperature. Because of that physical structure and that melt behavior then, we can describe the weld characteristics of various, these two families of resins. Amorphous resins, again, ABS, polystyrene, acrylic, PVC, things like that, polycarbonate, they have a wide process window to achieve a good weld. Because of that softening behavior, we can reshape them and reform them over a broad temperature range, and that makes them easy to process. They also work really well in blends. You'll see a lot of cross polymer compatibility in amorphous resins. Things like PCABS blends are ubiquitous in consumer products and the automotive industry, for example. Because of this softening behavior, they also can use all different types of weld joints. You can use shear joints, energy directors, all of the various types of geometries you might build into your parts to weld them are available for most amorphous resins. And in general, they have lower force and amplitude requirements than their semi-crystalline counterparts. This means you can use smaller or less powerful equipment to often process them, which can have commercial benefits. Amorphous resins are kind of great to weld. Semi-crystalline resins, on the other hand, are a little more difficult. These are things like nylon, polypropylene, PBT, PET, polyethylene, Semi-crystalline resins, when you touch them, are softer, especially if they're unfilled. They're spongy almost. And this behavior means they attenuate ultrasonic vibration. They absorb ultrasonic vibration. That makes them more difficult to process since we lose energy in our welding process. As a result, parts in semi-crystalline resins are 
have more limited feasibility. They generally require higher amplitude, more energy, more force, and longer weld times. There are fewer joint designs available for most semicrystalline resins as well. Certain high temperature resins might not work with energy directors, for example. And some of the extreme semicrystalline resins, things like Nyla or Riton or PBS, things like that, with really high melting temperatures, sometimes can't be welded at all. So in general, if you're using a semicrystalline resin for your product, you have to really consider whether ultrasonic welding is going to be the optimal bonding process for you. A very common question that I'll get from people reaching out to our applications team to, with a new project, for example, is whether or not the two materials they're considering bonding are compatible. Now, in general, amorphous resins have a lot of cross-polymer compatibility. If you have a PC and an ABS you're trying to bond, for example, there are a few things you need to keep in mind. First, the melting temperature, or specifically the softening range, for your two resins needs to be within about 20 degrees Celsius. If it's outside that, the two resins might have difficult melting at the same time, mixing and bonding. In addition to the well temperature, they need to have a similar melt flow index. What I mean by that is the rate at which the plastic actually flows after it is softened. Now there are various industry standards that people will use to test this. There's an ISO standard, uh, a 1133 standard, that is in grams per 10 minute. And if you have that test available for your materials, we recommend that it's within one gram per 10 minute. Generally, that would imply compatibility. But given the limitations of how this test is done, it's often at different temperatures, for example, this is really just the best guess. Ultimately, if you need to test whether two materials are compatible, the best way is to get two plaques and actually test weld them together which can be done in Duquesne's application labs all over the world, or you can do yourself if you have uh, an appropriate setup in your facility. It is important to note that not all polymers are compatible. Sometimes people will try to weld high density and low density polyethylene to, ex to each other. That generally doesn't work, as an example. And even within a family of resins, two different polycarbonates, for example, if those melt temperatures and melt flows are too different because of material properties or processing, they might not bond. So it is important to pay attention to how you select your resins. If you have any questions about whether or not two different materials are compatible, you can always find a material compatibility chart. These can be found on the Duquesne website or with a simple Google search. As you can see from the one I'm showing on here, there are a lot of options amongst amorphous resins that for cross-polymer compatibility. Semicrystalline resins have almost none. In, if you're using a semicrystalline resin, you pretty much have to bond it to itself. Understanding now something about the physical properties of plastics, let's talk about the other factors that might affect the weldability of your plastic. The first one is regrind. Now, ultrasonic welding is one of the few processes that can actually handle a regrind percentage. People commonly weld parts together that have been reground. The key, if you're going to have regrind in your parts, is to keep that percentage consistent. We recommend usually no more than 20%. And the reason for this is that polymer chains are massive. They're often 500 up to 10,000 times longer than they are thick. But every single time you reprocess your polymer, those chains break down and get smaller and that degrades their physical properties and impacts our ability to consistently and reliably weld them. In general, parts that have a regrind percentage are going to have weaker welds and just be weaker than an all virgin plastic part would be. But it is not exclusionary. You can process parts with regrind using ultrasonic welding. The next thing that might affect your weld is filler materials. Now, generally, weld strength does not directly benefit from having a film, filler material in your part. And the changes in mechanical properties you might get from your filler material don't always translate directly into your weld strength. Commonly, people will put things like talc or calcium carbonate, sometimes minerals, into their parts to reduce the amount of resin there. And ultrasonic welding can handle that. But much like regrind, we recommend you keep that to 20% or less of what is in your part. Those type of additives don't really have a benefit 
to your weld. Your weld strength is a resin to resin chemical bond only. So anything in that joint that is not plastic is not helping you. And in some cases, if you're using a high percentage of mineral or talc, you'll actually start degrading the surface of your sonotrodes. So it's important to keep in mind that that percentage should be minimized. The other very common non-resin additive that people will put into their parts is glass fiber. Now, glass fiber can actually make semi-crystalline we resins more weldable. It stiffens some of that spongy behavior in a manner that's advantageous. So nylon, for example, often benefits from having glass in it from a weldability perspective. If you're putting glass fiber in your parts, though, it is going to wear your tools. Most sonotrodes are titanium or aluminum. If there's a high glass percentage, you either need to coat those materials or consider using a hardened steel horn instead. So there are some tooling related considerations you must keep in mind when you're putting glass fiber into your parts. And lastly, there is a tendency for the glass fibers to collect in the joint. And as I mentioned before, your weld joint is just a resin to resin bond. So the higher density of glass fiber in a weld joint can actually make your weld joint weaker when compared to what you might achieve with an unfilled nylon. So keep in mind the mechanical advantages you get from adding glass fiber to your nylon don't necessarily translate to the weld strength as well. The next fiber that affects high weldability is hygroscopicity. Now hygroscopicity is the tendency of a resin to absorb moisture. Things like nylon and delrin and to a lesser extent polycarbonate and PSU, they exhibit a higher hygroscopicity than other resins. Some don't really experience it at all. Fundamentally, it just means your resin is absorbing water. And once your resin is holding that water, we must remove it as part of the re-melting and reforming process. You literally have to boil that water out of the joint. You'll see this in your parts. If you cross section or break apart your welds and your joints appear foamy, there's little holes or bubbles inside of them. That's often a sign that you have moisture in your part. Now, having a wet part can have an impact as low as just increasing the time you need to weld or increasing the energy you need to weld all the way over to making your process completely incapable and not being able to bond the parts at all. So in some cases, especially in nylon, you actually have to process or manage your parts differently prior to your ultrasonic welding uh, process. You either have to weld your parts immediately after molding them or store them with desiccant or in some sort of bag to keep moisture from getting into them. Or in extreme cases, you might have to heat your parts in an oven before they go into the welder simply to boil the water out. There are a number of other additives people will put into plastics that will impact your ultrasonic weld quality or the capability of your process. Things like lubricants or mold release agents, which are very common to get your parts out of the mold, reduce our ability to weld your parts. Ultrasonic welding relies on friction to generate heat. Anything that makes your part more lubricated reduces our ability to generate friction and makes it more difficult to process. Plasticizers are often added to resins in order to increase their ductility. The downside of this is that additive tends to migrate directly to the weld joint. That often reduces the strength of your parts versus a resin that doesn't include a plasticizer. Flame retardants are pretty common because they increase uh, fire resistance in your plastic, but they also tend to raise the melt temperature. So adding a flame retardant to a part will increase the energy and amplitude your ultrasonic system needs to deliver. And if you do that after you've spec'd your equipment and tooling, you might have insufficient capabilities on your machine to handle that change. Colorants also play a big role in the capability of your weld process. A single part molded in eight or 10 different colors might require eight or 10 different weld setups. The chemicals that are used to achieve those colors often changed the melt behavior and the melt temperature. And certain colors like blacks and whites, for instance, require a high percentage of colorant to achieve a good looking part. That colorant takes away from the amount of resin in the joint and can change how that joint forms and how strong it ultimately is. The last few factors that affect weldability are other additives you might add to your resin. 
Things like impact modifiers, which generally increase the amplitude required and the strength you will see from your ultrasonic welds. The reason for this is simply because anything that stiffens the part reduces our ability to use friction to remelt it and reform it. So a stronger resin will give us a weaker bond sometimes. Foaming agents are often added to lightweight plastic parts, but these actually are generally not weldable at all. If you put a bunch of tiny little bubbles into the structure of your part, we will simply collapse those bubbles like pressing on wet cardboard. So if you have a foaming agent in your resin, it, you should use a different assembly technology. Ultrasonic welding is not for you. And things like resin grade and age can play a role. Parts that you process with a brand new set of material, gotten from whoever your supplier might be, will weld differently than if that material sits for a month or two before you try to process it. So keep in mind that as your resin ages, your weld process might have to change with it. And lastly, there are a lot of new unique blends of materials on the market now. There are biodegradable resins, there are weird amorphous semi-crystalline blends with very strange melt behaviors. And some of these resins can be processed with ultrasonic welding, but because they don't have understood physical properties, or at least industry understood physical properties, your best course of action for any unique blends is to have an applications lab test it for you. Get sample plaques and have those processed to make sure that it actually can be reformed and bonded using ultrasonic welding. And that brings an end to our tech talk on material selection strategies for ultrasonic welding. I hope you learned a little bit about the different materials you might encounter and some of the factors that you need to consider when selecting the resin for your plastic part. If you ever have any questions or a project you're considering using ultrasonic bonding, reach out to your local Duquesne Ultrasonics Application Lab, and we'd be happy to walk you through all of this and help make your project success. Again, David Cermak, Principal Application Engineer, and until next time, thanks for attending.